Jesus glad and the devil mad. Amen. Let's rejoice. All right. Praise God. Let's get into the word, shall we? And like we always do, let's lift our Bibles up, wave them around, make Jesus glad and the devil mad. And let's say this together. Say, Heavenly Father, I've tuned in tonight. And one thing I don't have to pray for is rain because I've got rain now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> and just the right amount for my yard, my plants. And Father, I thank you. The rain of the Holy Ghost is present here tonight. You're going to water the word. You're going to bring me fresh word that I need to hear for my life so that I can accomplish my purpose in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. Let's turn to three uh, places, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And while you're turning, find uh, Titus chapter 3 and Romans chapter 6. We'll start with 2 Corinthians 5, 17, very far, a familiar verse. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. And, uh, and then Titus, uh, the third chapter, in verse 3, verse 4, excuse me, verse 4. For after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, and how? By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us barely. No, abundantly. He shed on, on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And then one more verse, it's uh, Romans chapter six and uh, verse three. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk or continue in newness of life. And so all these verses are talking about newness or renewed or new, new life. I wanted to talk tonight about walking in the new. It's vital for us believers to walk in the newness and the freshness of life. When you look up Romans 6, 4 in the linguistic key to the Greek New Testament, it mentions that that word newness there uh, is related to the idea of strangeness. I mean, you know, when you're born again and you've been, and you've been uh, made a new creature in Christ Jesus, you're not the same person that people used to know. Now, I use Jesus as an example. When he was risen from the dead, they didn't know who he was. They, he said, come over here and put your hands in, my, in, the, in the prints of my nails and put your hand in my side. No, it's me. So, you know, he had the marks of the, of the crucifixion, but he looked different. And, uh, and so there's a strangeness. There's, there's a familiarity, and yet we're not quite the same. There's something different about us. See, that's what that newness means. It's freshness. And, and it should be all the time. It, 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 it shouldn't be just when we got saved way back, you know, whenever that was. It, it, it's it's the, the verb there uh, to be uh, in Christ. We're new creatures. We've been made new creatures. That's continuing every single moment. There's a regeneration that's happening all the time, constantly. So we're constantly changing and growing in our spirit. So... <clears throat> You know, Romans 6 talks about in newness of life. Life, that word life is zoe. It's the Greek word zoe. It's the life that God lives. Life as God lives it. That's what Jesus came to give us. He came to give us life. He didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make, uh, you know, lost people saved. He, made, he came to get, make dead people live. <laughs> I was dead, now I'm alive. And I'm alive all the time. And that's the thing we need to walk in. Yeah, we're surrounded by a world largely that's, that's dead, that's separated from God, and uh, rushing to judgment. And, uh, you know, our job is to get a, get a 
a harvest out of that group of people. We don't want to see them go to hell. We want to see them, uh, you know, saved. And, and the gospel has the power, the gospel, the good news of being in Christ, that you, all you've got to do is say yes to him. Uh, it's such good news that people need to hear that. Uh, but at the same time, nations, peoples are decaying. They have the fragrance of death. You know, there's a verse in here, 2 Corinthians 2, 15, 16. You know, we're the, we're the savor or the fragrance of life unto life and death unto death. What does that mean? It says in, the, in them that, that perish, we're the, we're the smell of death to them. Uh, you know, that's why a lot of times people that are lost don't like to be around us. They, they find it very uncomfortable. I found that true in my own life. I've, I have a whole lot of people that I grew up with in my uh, teenage years. We have these class reunions, and every one of them that's not saved, they don't care anything about hearing what I do. <laughs> you know, they don't, they don't want to know that. They don't want to think about that. They want to talk about the past. They, well, I don't want to talk about the past. The past is when I was lost, but now I'm a new creature. <laughs> And so we're told then here in these verses to walk in newness of life or continue that if we do, we'll be a fragrance of life and a beacon of light in a dark world. That's, that's what the world needs right now is the church to be the church, believers to be believers, to be filled with the Spirit of God, to have this washing of regeneration. You know, I like to use the new car illustration. I, you know, one of the you know, I've had a lot of new cars and uh, love car. I'm a car person and I love cars. And so, you know, every so often, even when they're not needed, I'll go buy a new one. I know it's, that's so wasteful. Well, you know, whatever. That's my business. Your business. If you want to keep one until it falls apart, you go ahead. I did that earlier in my life. <laughs> so, <laughs> I got tired of working on old junk heaps. Uh, but, you know, one of the one of the positives about a new car is that new car smell. It's just amazing. And then at some point, we don't know how long it lasts, suddenly you go out there and it doesn't smell that way anymore. It just, it just disappears. It goes away. You know, anything that just sits is just going to, finally, it's going to just sort of deteriorate. That's just how it is. You know, I, I went to the, I had my truck washed and vacuumed and and, uh, and they asked me what kind of fragrance. I said, give me the new car. Well, we don't have that anymore. Uh, and I remembered that when the last time I had to put the new car fragrance in there, it didn't smell like the new car fragrance. <laughs> it smelled like cherries or strawberries. I don't know. It, it smelled terrible. It did not smell anything like, uh, you know, a new car. So then I said, how about leather? Have you got the leather smell? And so, yeah, we've got the leather smell. It doesn't smell like leather. I don't know what it smells like, but it doesn't smell like leather. <laughs> But I'm telling you, you know, that new car smell, you know, we have a fragrance of life unto life and it has to be stirred up. We have to be conscious of that newness of life. We're challenged in these verses that I'm reading right now to walk and continue in that newness of life because we've been raised from the dead with Christ. You know, I remember years and years ago, my brother Bob, his wife Sylvia, they had three young girls, Lisa, Don, and Lori. And little girls, you know, and they, they bought a big old station wagon. He had a Ford first, then he bought this new uh, Pontiac, I think it was, big old wood, you know, the fake wood sides and everything, and it had a real interesting back tailgate. It had a tailgate that didn't open, you know, it didn't flat, oh, fold out flat, it didn't open out wide, it just, the whole thing recessed into the bottom of the car and went under the third seat. The third seat in that station wagon faced to the rear. And so the little girls loved to ride there because they could face out the back of the car. And, uh, and so that's where they always, you know, you had the, all this space in between mom and dad in the front. Then you had the middle seat, nobody sitting there. And then Lisa, Don, and Laurie sitting in the third seat looking out the back of the, of the car. And they just thought it was so neat. And he would just turn a little key and that whole door would recess down into underneath where they were sitting. And they would just hop out on the top of the bumper and get out of the, of the car that way. They didn't even go through the door. They went out the back tailgate. So one day, you know, they went out there and it started smelling not so good. And it got worse and worse. And it's still a new car. And it lost the new car smell and started stinking. And he finally had to take it to the dealer and they had to unhook all of that door mechanism and had to get lift the floorboards up and get down under there and they found a, a ham sandwich that had fallen down <laughs> in the space underneath that the seats in the back and uh, and it had you know decayed 
And, uh, you know, that car was never the same. I mean, <laughs> but, you know, the Bible talks about regeneration. You know, we, even if we've been backslid, even if we've done things we're ashamed of, you know, the Holy Ghost can come in and regeneration can happen. We can be washed with the washing of water by the Word. I'm telling you, we can, we can regain that new car smell, <laughs> if you want to put it that way. <laughs> you know, never the same, never the same. Um, you know, talking about looking a little different. When I first got saved, I was still going to the Catholic Church for a few months until I heard, got, grew up enough to hear from the Holy Ghost and find, find out that he was through with me going to the Catholic Church. He wanted me at Lakewood. And, but at first, I didn't know that, so I was going to both churches. I'd go to Catholic Church most of the time, and then about once or twice a month, we'd get, drive, the, drive out to Lakewood, go to, to Lakewood. <clears throat> and, uh, and at the time, I was a lector in the Catholic Church. That's... A, that's somebody that reads either one of the Old Testament verses or one of the New Testament verses in the Mass. So I participated in the Mass by reading a portion of Scripture. And so I had to get there early and march in with the priest, you know, the altar boys and kind of ceremonial type thing. And, you know, dress up like, you know, with a suit and, you know, be presentable. So the head guy that was head of the lectors, uh, was there and he happened to be the other lector, you know, uh, this particular Sunday. I think he was reading the Old Testament. I'm reading the New Testament verses. And, uh, and he kept staring at me, you know, it was a little short Italian guy from, from uh, Buffalo, New York, big old schnozzola, you know, he looked real Italian. And he was Italian and uh, had that New York accent, you know. <laughs> And he said, he said, John, he said, I, I'm sorry to stare, but you just look so different. He said, have you lost weight or something? I mean, you should look different. I said, no, George. I said, what happened was I, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I've been born again. And I've been filled with the Holy Ghost, the evidence of speaking in other tongues. I just let it all come out, just all at one time, just like that, <laughs> like a fire hose. And uh, he kind of blinked, and he, his head went back a little bit. And he blinked a couple more times and looked at me, and he says, Oh! <laughs> That's all he said. <laughs> I think he started smelling something uh, that, he was <laughs> that he wasn't acquainted with. But see, we're different. We're different when, we, when we're... We have to look, look... We can keep that all our Christian life. It just has to be stirred up. We have to stir it up. Amen. We need to stir it up. So, Smith Wigglesworth one time told, tells a testimony of riding on a train full of preachers going to a, a meeting in Ireland, and they're riding a train, and he got up to go to the men's room, and he's walking down the center aisle of this car, train car, it's going down the road, clickety -clack, down the tracks, clickety-clack, you know, and one of the preachers got up out of his seat as he passed him and he said, sir, you make me want to repent of my sin. And he fell down on his knees in the middle of the aisle and began to weep. And within a few minutes, the whole car was weeping and repenting of their sins. And some people got saved. This is a car full of preachers going to a, a preacher's convention. And some of them got saved and some of them were backslid. I mean, it's amazing. Just what was it? It was, it was the newness of life that he walked in and it, and it confronted the sin in their lives. It confronted that other spirit that was trying to take over. Oh, praise God. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Thank God for the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So let's look back at 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And uh, again, it says, therefore, if any man, any person be in Christ, See, the moment you get saved, that's when you're in Christ. You're baptized into Christ. You're baptized into Christ's death. And then so then when he's raised, you're raised. So if any man, uh, uh, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. It doesn't say he will become. He became at one point and then it was over. No, it's that, that verb is, is continual fulfillment. So every minute of every day, you're newer than you were the minute before. You're constantly being regenerated. You're constantly being changed. Now, it's up to us then to stir that up, see? Because if we don't stir it up, then nobody can tell the difference. Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, leaving the, 
leaving, I was talking about this illustration the other day, but when you leave the creamed gravy in the gravy boat out on the, on the, on the counter, and you don't, nobody's got the spoon in there taking it and putting it on their chicken fried steak. Well, pretty soon what happens is get a skin grows over the top of it. You know, listen, there's, there's people walking around. They're saved all right, but there's a skin. It, it, there's, a, there's a film over them, and it blocks this fragrance. It blocks this countenance that we're supposed to have everywhere we go. Hallelujah. Amen. So, Old things are passed away, and all things are become new. See, again, that, that is the uh, present tense, present perfect tense, which means continual fulfillment. Every minute of every day, you're becoming new. And a continuous action, not just back when you got saved. The washing of regeneration by the Word of God in Titus. The renewing of the Holy Ghost. See, all of that speaks of newness. All of that speaks of fragrance. All of that speaks of cleansing. Uh, Ephesians 5.18, be habitually and continually filled with the Holy Ghost. Speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. I spent a lot of time uh, at one time in my life around Brother Osteen. Spent a lot of time around him. And whenever he wasn't occupied in a specific task, he's praying in other tongue. And, I, and at first, I'd, I'd uh, what did what, what, you say? No, I'm just speaking in other tongues. He got irritated because he's just speaking in other tongues. He wasn't talking to me, he's talking to him. <laughs> and so I had to get with that rhythm, you know, on a trip. I mean, he's just sitting there in the airplane, a 20 hour flight, and he's praying in other tongues most of the time. What was he doing? He's stirring himself up. He's keeping that fragrance going. He's keeping that anointing flowing. He's let those living waters are ready to be tapped into that flood is ready to flood out over uh, people that, that have need. And, uh, and so Romans 6 says walk in newness. In other words, that word walk means continue. It doesn't just mean, you know, when you first get saved. Continue in newness of life. Yeah, we have to impose our fragrance of life and our countenance of light upon this world. It has to be imposed. And the only way that we can do that is walk in the new. So just three things tonight. Just to, These are things that you have heard uh, and you just need to be reminded. We all need to be reminded, especially when we have all this bad news hitting us. I mean, I just, you know, I'm tempted like you are. I get so aggravated listening to all this news. And it's not news. It's, it's propaganda. And it's one-sided. It, it gets tiring. How do, we, how do we get over it? Well, doing the things that I'm talking about tonight, we can walk in the newness of life. We can keep that new car smell. <laughs> All right, so walk in the new, number one, spiritually. You know, it's the Word and the Spirit. Colossians 3.16. Let's turn over there real quick. I hope you're getting something out of this tonight. But I think we all need to stay fresh. We need to all stay stirred up and on fire. Uh, Colossians 3, 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. See what happens is when you get so filled and so stirred, you're going to impact other believers. You're going to impact your friends. You're going to impact people that you work with here at the church, here that you, you do the believers ministry with. And uh, that's the way it ought to be when, we're, when we stir ourselves up. And, and so we have to feed our spirit on the Word of God and be continually, habitually filled with the Holy Ghost, the Word and the Spirit. I preached about this recently about leaning, uh, depending on your spirit. 1 Corinthians 14, 4, he that prays in an unknown tongue edifies himself. And the word edify means build up from the foundation. You know, it means to rebuild, to repair, to restore. See, sometimes we just get, we get a little bit under attack. We get a little bit discouraged. Hey, pray much in other tongues and your spirit will start getting built back up. And you're, you're going to start repairing some things that if you don't do that, you know, you leave the devil, a door open for the devil to attack you. Jude verse 20, building up yourself on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. So uh, your spirit is you and you're continually made new and fresh. And then, of course, as you do that, your spirit will dominate your mind and your body. So walk in the new spiritually. Then number two, walk in the new mentally. 
mentally, in your mind. Romans 12, 2, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, perfect will of God. Be, re- be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When I was studying this one time, God says, you know, you use the word renew and a lot of people, uh, they kind of lose the meaning of renew. Uh, say refresh. <laughs> I mean, don't you have to use air freshener sometimes? <laughs> <laughs> and so that's what we do. We need some air freshener. We need some, we, we need some freshener in our brain tissue because it gets, it gets stale up in there. We start thinking the same old thoughts all the time, the worldly thoughts. Uh, so as you're feeding your spirit, you're actually renewing your mind to God, Bible truth. That's exactly what you're doing two things at once. When you read your Bible and pray, you're actually doing what it takes to renew your mind. And it says be transformed. Uh, transformed is a major word. It means to look like something totally different. See, that's what we've been talking about. You look different. Jesus looked so different after he rose from the dead, his own disciples didn't know him. They didn't know who he was. So, I mean, you know, we have a lesser extent of that in this body now. But uh, we, we need to get mentally refreshed or renewed, or reprogrammed is a good word. Reprogrammed. You know, our, you start reading your Bible, now that's God's thoughts right there. That's, these are the thoughts of God. The thoughts of God are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. Where, where are his thoughts? Where are his ways? They're right here. So that's why we need to read them every day. We, well, I've already read that. Well, you need to read it again today because you need to have a fresh uh, intake I mean, what, what if you just had that glass of milk sitting out on the countertop and six months later you said, you know what, I need a glass of milk. I think I'm going to have this glass of milk. You, know, <laughs> you probably have to take you to uh, the emergency room. Yeah, it just, it, everything without it being used, it just turns. It goes bad. So let's stir it up. And uh, no longer conform to this world's way of thinking. Be not tra- conformed. To this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh, so let's, uh, it's, it's talking about this world's way of thinking. When you watch the news on a continual basis, you're just getting this world's way of thinking about every single thing you can think. Even if it's a good, I mean, even Newsmax. I can't watch Newsmax very long. It's, it's, I think they're telling mostly the truth, but I can't hear that all night long. I can't, I don't want to hear that. It's all bad news to me. I want, I, I, listen, I have my faith out there. I'm believing that God's going to move in a mighty way in America. God's not through with America, and we're going to have a revival. That's what my faith speaking, and I don't want anything suggesting that that's not going to be the case. I don't agree with that. There's a lot of people don't agree. They just think it's all over now. See, it's, since the FBI invaded Mar-a-Lago, they think it's all over. What is not all over? No, we got a long way to go. <laughs> Amen. So, uh, you know, the world's always looking back. We need to look ahead. It always thinks death. It thinks victimhood. But we're looking to a bright future. Praise God. We're thinking life. We're thinking victory. We're thinking love. Praise God. And then the last one, walk in the new physically. And, uh, and so let's look at Romans again. Your physical man, so important. Verse 11, for, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, how many of that's true? See, the Holy Ghost dwells in you, doesn't he? Anybody that's saved has to raise their hand, yes. So if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up dead Christ from the dead shall also quicken or make alive your mortal bodies that dwe- by his spirit that dwelleth in you. I just really believe that we don't have to die of all kind of diseases. I don't believe we have to just get sick to die. I believe that we can live as long as we are satisfied. And just like the the patriarchs of old, they would just gather the family around. It's time to go home. And they would gather their legs up underneath them and they'd just leave. And they weren't sick. I think about Brother Hagin. He died kind of at 83. But on the day he died, nobody knew he was going to die. He didn't prophesy, I'm going to die today. I'm leaving today. No, he didn't tell anybody. But he was sitting at home and sitting in his favorite chair. And he had just eaten his favorite meal. And they brought him a big old bowl of strawberry shortcake. (laughs) 
<laughs> and he loved strawberry shortcake. And he had this big bowl. And I mean, it had the shortcake and the strawberries and the whipped cream. And man, he was just sitting there and eating that and shaking his head and smiling. And he leaned back and he left and he went to heaven. <laughs> I mean, no sickness, no disease, no heart attack, no stroke. Uh, you know, listen, you know, we, we, we have a lot to say about our health. If we just speak health, if we won't, we'll speak, don't speak sickness and disease. I know many of you battling things. Well, just, you know, uh, Psalm 103, 5, something I, I talk about, say, say every day. Um, let's read it, get it in front of you. Psalm 103, all these benefits. These are all benefits that belong to us. And they're in the Old Testament. We got a better covenant found upon better promises. <clears throat> Who satisfies thy mouth with good, good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. <laughs> Amen. That's what I confess over myself every morning. My youth is renewed like the eagles. And besides that, you know, when I, after my open heart surgery, God spoke to me. He said, I've reset your clock. <laughs> Please reset the clock to two minutes. You know, the, the two minute warning, you know, at the end of a football game, you know, they're, you know, they have a play and then they have, you know, a penalty and everything. And they say, Please reset. That's what I heard in my, in my, in my mind when God spoke that to me. And he reset my clock. You know, really, the clock really means the clock ran out on that team going for the touchdown. But the referee said, no, let's reset the clock. And then they go in and they score and they win the game. But really, the game had run out of time. But the, but he, but the referee reset the clock. I'm like, God, reset my clock. My clock had run out. Praise God. So I'm, I'm in charge of my clock now. I'm going to pay more attention to my clock. <laughs> that is my mouth. So speak life to your body. Look at all the people that aged in the Bible. Abraham and Sarah, 190, 100 years old and 90 years old, and they had a baby. Uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth, same thing. Moses lived a long time. Uh, Abraham lived a long, 150 some odd years. I mean, you know, well, that's Bible. I don't care. It's still people that had an Old Testament. We've got a better covenant. I don't think we've tapped into our health the way we can. We give in to all of this, these, this spirit of lawlessness in, in our society. And they're trying to sell us all these heavy drugs. And every, every, you know, if you watch television very long, they've got, they've got advertising after advertising of these drugs to help you with every kind of subject you can think of. And when you go to buy those drugs, they're so expensive that most people have to have financial help to get them. I mean, they're making trillions of dollars off of sick people. Sure, they want you sick. Because they want to bleed you dry before you die. <laughs> no, third John 2, God's priority is for us to prosper and be in health even along life's journey. Amen. Continue along life's journey. So Proverbs 12, 18, the tongue of the wise is health. So I speak to my body. I speak. I tell it how to feel. I don't listen to how it feels. I tell it how it ought to feel. And uh, just uh, one more little uh, testimony in my in my youth uh, I had uh, growing up around my family my mother's oldest sister she was my mother was the youngest of four and uh, her oldest sister Glaney uh, had married way back uh, to an old wildcatter and his name was Jack and uh, you know his family called him Daddy Jack he was kind of elderly he was the elder statesman of the family because he was older than my dad and my uncles and uh, they called him Daddy Jack, and he was kind of old and a little more gray-headed and, you know, kind of bent over a little bit. And we would come to Refurio from here. When we lived in Houston. We'd go to Refurio to see my mother would see her sister, and we'd stay there a couple of days, and I'd be with my cousins. And uh, we'd be playing around in the house, my aunt's house. And they would come, and they'd say, now, shh, now y'all be getting too loud. You're going to have to be real quiet. Daddy Jack's back in that bathroom, in the back room back there, and he's laying down. Doctors told him he had to have his rest. You know, he could just, he could just die of a heart attack any moment. So you've got to get, you're being too loud. Just, you just quiet down now or go outside because he's got to have his rest. So we were always told how frail he was, how he's about ready to kill over dead. Yeah, you know, that's what you think when you're a little kid. You think he's going to die, you know, right now. 
And uh, it'd be 100 degrees outside, and he'd wear a jacket. He'd have a hat and gloves to and drive this old unair-conditioned Oldsmobile, this ancient, rusty-looking, looked like a big roach, you know, driving down the road. And we, he'd take me to go get a block of ice, you know, for the ice box. You know, we'd, <laughs> they didn't have a refrigerator, they had an ice box. <laughs> anyway, so I, I grew up with that, that old man. See, he's old. Well, I still remember it was 1958. My aunt, Glaney, died. She died of cancer. And this old man, her grave wasn't even, uh, the flowers weren't wilted on her grave when he remarried. <laughs> and he was older than she was at that time. And he lived at least another 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> old Daddy Jack had died any moment. <laughs> Well, you know what? I made up my mind. If Daddy Jack can live that long, to being an old geezer, I, I, you know, I'm serving God. I can live as long as I want to, and so can you. All we have to do is walk in the new. 